Okay, there we go. So, uh, uh, um, so because I didn't start recording earlier, don't be afraid of your instrument. So, uh, closet hurdy gurdy players, as as I said, uh, are not people that that secretly play hurdy gurdy. They're people that have an instrument. They can't figure out how to make it work. They put it in the closet, and when somebody says, "I have," somebody says anything like, "Oh, I like black sails," they've got a hurdy gurdy in the beginning. They go, "I have a hurdy gurdy." They go in the closet, pull it out, and go, Eah! and then they put it back in the closet and don't touch it again for you know another year and a half. Don't be a closet hurdy gurdy player. Um, don't be afraid of your instrument. I pick up my instrument like this all the time. But that's the way I, I grab it under the keys with this side and stick my thumb over the top. I'll, I've carried it around like this before. You know, I, I, you don't, don't grab it by the handle and walk around with it because that, that might damage something. But, you know, I, I picked it up to display it. it it's, it, it, I, I put my thumb under that side and wrapped it around the other side. <clears throat> don't be afraid. First off, it's, it's an instrument. If it was a guitar, you'd have to pick it up. You'd have to do all these things to it. So don't be afraid. Um, <clears throat> next, uh, <clears throat> there are things you're going to need to do to your instrument that to, to make adjustments to it. Th there's, there's one kind of quick and fast rule to this. Uh, unless you truly damage your instrument, everything is replaceable. So if you knock the ear off of your instrument, you know, what have you, you can get another one and have it glued back on. You got to get somebody to, you know, get a luthier to do it for you. But it's possible. It's not a, like, this is not a, a life ending thing or, a, you know, instrument ending thing. Um, of course, if you, you know, do like they used to do and still do in France on occasion where they, they hang it above the fireplace and let it, you know, they, they basically, I think they're curing them. Maybe they look like ham, so they're trying to cure them with the smoke or something. I'm not sure, but they hang them above the fireplace <clears throat> and they use a little thin gut string on a little nail that sticks out of the wall and then they fall off the wall and smash onto the ground. And uh, there's a whole bunch of old French hurdy-gurdies with damage all through here from the, the crank smashing into the back end. Um, you know, you don't want to do that. But aside from that, don't be afraid of it. Um, the, the, it, it's, it's wood. Y you can get new wood, replace it. There, there are people that are qualified to rebuild the whole thing. But aside from that, little adjustments, don't be, don't worry about it. Um, there, there, the, those little adjustments, um, can be, if they're, especially if they're like, the, you know, quick adjusters where they've got screws and things like that, everything you adjust can be undone if it, if you need to. So, um, so that's the first thing. Don't be afraid of your instrument. Second, uh, when you, um, we're, we're just going to talk about the, the right now, just beginning, like if you have never had an instrument before, have never had a hurdy gurdy before, and you decide I'm just, I'd be buy one, you get it out of the box, what are you going to do? So when you get it out of the box, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at it and go, oh, this is great. What do I do? And you're going to grab the crank and you're going to um, and it's probably not going to be in tune, so it's going to squeal a lot. And uh, you, you, we'll, we'll go on to how to make those adjustments. But right now, I want to show you what to do just to get started playing. So very first thing <clears throat> that you want to do um, is you, you need to uh, make sure. And, and, it, and if your luthier does not send you the tuning for your instrument, make them send you the tuning for your instrument. You need to know what string on your instrument is in what tune. If you just assume, they said, oh, it's in, it's a G, GC hurdy-gurdy. So you just assume, well, oh, everything's in G. You start cranking up, you find out, oh, that drone was in C and I just broke the drone string. Make them give you all of the string uh, information on top of that, make them give you all of the strings that they used. Don't accept the fact that they just say, oh, it's in C. What string did you use? Did you use a viola string? Is this a, you know, is this a string from a weed eater? What string is it? I need to know because if I have to replace it or something goes wrong, I need to have it. Um, the other thing is, talk to your luthier about spare strings. Um, I use a lot of gut strings, so I buy gut strings from a from a dealer online. 
Um, and uh, the, the way that they ship them is usually meant for guitars uh, or, or, or uh, plucked type strings. So they're extra long. So you can get two strings out of one, you know, two link, string lengths for your hurdy-gurdy out of one package. So know those, that's important. Tuning is, knowing your tuning is important, knowing which strings you have on it, and then know which string goes to which tuner. Um, I picked up an instrument just yesterday, uh, day before, uh, and all of the pegs were not where I thought they were going to be. Um, the Tekaroos are like notorious for that, where you think, oh, it's going to be this one. It's not that one. It's almost always not that one for some reason. So make sure you know which strings go to which pegs. That's going to be important for tuning. Once you get used to that, you'll, you'll be fine. The other thing that happens, and it happens uh, especially when people do string replacements or whatever, um, they turn the, turn the tuners in random directions. So the French, the French instruments, they all tune left. Uh, they even have a, uh, when I say tune left, that means they go up in pitch whenever you turn the tuner to the left, so counterclockwise. Um, they even have a tool called a turn a gauche, and a turn a gauche just means turn left. Um, and it's, uh, so, so make sure you know all that, and make sure that if, if your instrument has a bunch of random, like this one turns right, and that one turns left, and this one, you know, Make sure they go the right directions that's logical to you. So on a violin, you know, these pegs turn left, these pe pe pegs turn right. Just know which ones you're, you're tuning and how to tune them and what the tunings of your strings are. Okay, vitally important uh, from the very beginning. Um, you often get people that um, get a new instrument, strap it on, start making adjustments. And they're like, it's not doing anything. It's not doing it. Bang! The string that they weren't tuning or weren't trying to tune pops because they were on the wrong tuner. Make sure you know. I've done it. Don't, don't feel bad if it happens. Um, but just make sure you know. That, that's going to be uh, a, a big key. So next, um, when you get your instrument, you're going to want to get a strap. So the strap, oop, don't do that. Um, I use typical belt width strap. Uh, it's got the typical little peg hole on the end. There you go. A little hole on the end uh, and a, a, an adjustable, and it's got a whole, multiple holes on the other end and adjustable buckle in the middle to, to, for fine adjustments. Um, I have used straps that are one inch straps, little thin straps. I've used straps that are the same type of strap as far as the other one goes and just a, a thinner weight leather. Uh, I have used the thicker back strap type thing and guitar straps left and right. No, you know, but the one thing I wanna say is that there seems to be this progression to like bodybuilder straps. Like this, you know, you buy a strap and the back of it is like this wide. It's decorative because somebody's done a bunch of leather work on it, but it's like that wide. You don't need it. I mean, sure, if you want to, fine, but you don't need it. A simple leather belt strap or a guitar strap works great. There, there's no problem with it. So there's your strap. Um, when you see, so you take the strap, hook it onto the back pin or whichever pin you want. I tend to just leave the back pin on uh, and then strap it over the other side. Some people feel it's the other way around, whatever your preference is. Um, the other type of strap, and I don't have one with me today, but it's, it's a Y strap and it, it, it straps, it, it's got a, a belt that hooks here and it's got another belt connection that hooks here. So this uh, peg on these hurdy-gurdies um, in general is for uh, walking and playing. So when you stand up and play, uh, especially you know when they when they're doing processional type uh, uh, playing, they'll put a strap that goes around their waist and then up and over their shoulder. Uh, oftentimes it comes under the the uh, tailpiece here and then straps onto this side over here. You don't need that strapped up like that if you are not playing in that way. 
Um, so you don't necessarily have to have a Y strap. It, they, they work fine. Uh, it, most people just use the single, the, the single side and then they just have the extra just in case. Um, so you don't necessarily need that. Now the other thing that Y straps, that uh, people use Y straps for are tend to be for flat, to, flat back instruments where they play the instrument like this against their body. So they'll put both straps on the, both uh, points on the buttons, pull the other one around and hook it to the other, to the other side. Um, I, I know a lot of people that play like this and I'm gonna tell you, I don't recommend it. Um, not, those people, there's some amazing players that play like that. So just like truly phenomenal players. But if you're starting out, I don't recommend it. And I don't recommend it for, for several reasons, but mostly because you're gonna hurt yourself. And I, and, uh, you know, I don't mean like, you know, things gonna fall off or whatever. If you look at a player who plays like that, watch the angle of their wrist. That is, that right there is carpal tunnel in five years. So if, if you play, the farther you rotate this up, the farther you have to reach around to play. So if you've got, you know, you, if you need to play in the keys and your hand is like that, that's bad body dynamics. That's bad uh, body mechanics for the instrument. Um, same for the, the players that tend to play up here. Bad body dynamics. Your, your arm is doing this. It's just terrible on your shoulder. Your elbow's got to be way out. Your hand's got to be way out. It's just, it's, there, there are players that do it. Once again, I don't recommend it. If you want to play like that, more power to you. But I, I guarantee you in about five years, you're going to be thinking, I should have stopped doing that like five years ago uh, because it's going to hurt. So this is what we do. Um, the other thing you get, once you get the into you know, your strap, the other big thing people do is they put it around the middle of their back. So they do this, right? They'll hook it up like that. That's typical. This is what you see all the time. You see, uh, I see like seasoned professional players playing for a long, long time. They hook the belt all the way up around their back and then they hook the instrument and play like that. You need to have it really snug against your body to do that. It needs to be tight. But once again, I don't recommend that either. There are players that do it and they've been doing it for, you know, probably hundreds of years that play like this. But the, the idea is that you want to learn to play and you need to be comfortable while you're doing it. And if you take a belt like that and you try to play, it pulls on your low back. So you're, you're you, I mean, you kind of get this, I'm, I'm sitting upright feel, but it pulls on your low back and it's not, especially the, what is it, uh, Sanfona, or what are the big instrument that, um, uh, that's become popular now, Michelinda plays it. Um, it's, it's big and it's heavy and it pulls, if you put the weight on your back, it's pulling on your back. So, <clears throat> um, I don't recommend that either, especially in the beginning. If you want to do it later on or if you want to play it as a, as a whole, you know, once you've decided to, if you're gonna if you're gonna strap it on, but it, it's once again it's bad for you. It's it's got two, three problems. Three problems that first off it's pulling on your back. Second, the if you look at a guitar player, the guitar player never plays the guitar. Never plays a guitar where he takes the instrument, the guitar, and just centers it on his body so that he's playing the frets here and playing, unless you're in a flea or something, you're playing way the hell down here. Um, if you're doing that, you know, you're not comfortably playing guitar. You're like doing some weird thing and people are going to be like, why are you doing that? Just shove the guitar over, play here, right? It makes more sense. But yet a guitar strap is, it ties up to the, the, the neck of the instrument and goes around the, 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 your shoulder and your back. So the guitar wants to fall naturally down that direction, right? It wants to center itself on your body weight wise. <clears throat> and when you, so if, if you're playing guitar and you're playing like that and you let go of it, it'll slide into the middle of your body. Players have to actually actively shove the instrument unless they're sitting down. They have to actually shove the instrument into the playing position. With a hurdy-gurdy, 
if you strap it around your back like that, it will do the same thing. It will eventually migrate itself to be centered on your body. Now, if it's centered on your body, it, it, it's, it's aesthetically pleasing. People are going to say, oh, yeah, you know, you, you play it. It looks good in the middle. It, it, just like the guitar player playing like this may look good in the middle, but it plays better this way. Same thing with a hurdy-gurdy. It needs to be shoved over that thing. And the reason is, um, is that your crank needs to be in line with your shoulder. And the way to make that happen with your belt is to put the belt down at your belt line on this side. So just on the, on the, on the side with the crank, you're going to put the belt down at your belt line. And on the other side, where it's up at your belt line, you're going to push it down kind of underneath your butt a little bit, like that. So that when you sit, now, because this wants to keep this instrument straight, because it's at my belt line, it wants to keep this side of the instrument here. And this side, because it's down and away, wants to pull the instrument that way. So now you've got an instrument that is centered on your body, um, it, or, or not centered, now you've got an instrument that is already in the proper playing position. You don't need to keep shoving it over. You don't need to worry about it while you're playing. And you don't need to worry about whether it's going to mess up your, your, you know, your joints later on or you know, cause any sort of muscle damage. So <clears throat> I have rheumatoid arthritis, and it's terrible on my shoulders. My shoulders always hurt. So I do everything I can to stop that from getting worse. So, um, so now that you've got this belt up here and then down along kind of underneath your butt over here. Um, now we're going to talk about, and I wish this, okay, I'm going to shift this down a little bit so you can see the instrument a little better. I, you don't need to see my head, you need to see the instrument. Okay, so um, this, uh, now that the playing position is here, you've got the belt where you want it, you're sitting down. The, the, the important portion when you sit down, don't get an armed chair. You're going to bang your elbow into the armchair. I use, uh, I, I often use um, music benches, piano benches. And let me back a little bit. Um, I, have to use, I often use piano benches because they're uh, fully adjustable um, the height wise. So you can sit up taller uh, as opposed to like a, a, just a standard chair where it's, you know, it's eating level. It's, it's meant to be below the table. It's not meant to, meant to be, they're, they're, they're not meant to sit you upright. They're meant to sit you at a table. So <clears throat> I use these, the, these benches so that they're, I can make them taller. Uh, and the other thing I tend to do, there's a, there's a standard $50 piano bench. Um, the other thing you do when you sit uh, is you sit at the edge of the, the chair. Don't sit flat. So if you sit flat back, your legs, your legs become, they're level because you're sitting with your legs up at the, at the level of the chair. You don't want that. You want the instrument to tip downwards because the keys are gravity fed or keys are gravity controlled. So if, you, if you're flat and you push in on a key, it's likely to stay there. If you tip the instrument down, the key is going to work with gravity away from the, the, you know, work towards the moving away from the string. So, so sit, sit upright, sit with the belt around your waist and under your, kind of under your butt on the other side, sit at the edge of the chair. And then essentially that will give you all of the, the body dynamics you need. Now you're going to want this. Usually I, I tend to, I do all kinds of different things because it, Depends on how I feel at the time, but usually your right leg, your crank side, is up in the standard kind of bent leg position. And the other leg, which you can't see very clearly, is back, or I, I, I play forward where I just put my foot out in front of me uh, just to trip people as they go by because I'm mean. Um, but also, uh, you, you can put your foot backwards and tip your leg down. So that means one leg is up and level, and the other is down. 
Um, and that means that when you're playing, this side is up towards your shoulder and towards your elbow, and this side is down so that you can rest your hand on it comfortably. So that's your sitting position. Now, uh, I'm going to do this real quick. And we're going to post these uh, online. So essentially, you see flat, don't sit flat, sit at the edge, the instrument in line, or the, you know, the instrument centered, one leg up, one leg down. Don't set it to the side so that it's centered on your body. Set it in line with your shoulder, like that one. The belt goes around your upper waist on one side and down to the other side on the other side. Okay, so, um, there you go. There, and the, the, just in case anybody says, but why would I do that? There's no reason to do that. I don't need to put the belt like that. Uh, this has been actually, it's a, somebody actually went to a body dynamic specialist who, who did the body mechanics on them. They went through the whole ergodynamics of playing, the body dynamics of playing, and they said, they, they reviewed, uh, they they did it all, they do this with uh, musicians in Paris. So they basically, they, had, they tried a bunch of different musical instruments. They said, you know, oh, you gotta, you know, tilt your shoulder like this to play the violin. When you play the, the cello, make sure that you don't hunch over the cello. You know, all those types of things. And they got to the hurdy-gurdy and they went, we've never seen one of those before. And they sat, um, Toby Miller in particular, they sat Toby Miller down and said, okay, show us how you play. So she did that, they studied her, she went back, she, she left, they came back and they said, okay, here's what we're gonna change. Here's, you're gonna, here's why we're gonna change it and here's why, we do the, why we're gonna tell you to change it. And it's because she's a professional player and you don't wanna hurt yourself over, over time. And so this is all these kind of instructions about where the belts go and how to hold yourself, all comes from that. It didn't come, this isn't a, you know, I didn't make this up out of whole cloth. This actually comes from somebody who actually did the body, body mechanics to find out, yes, this is how you should sit if you don't want to damage yourself over the long time, over the long term. So, um, so belt, strap, or strap up here on your belt line, down below here on this side. Crank should be in line with your shoulder. So when you put your hand on it, that's where the crank should be. You don't want to do this. It's terrible on your joints. Just, you know, just churning butter like this all day long is terrible for you. Push it over. Try to get the crank, like the center of the axle, in line with your elbow. So that when you turn, you're not doing this or you're doing not doing some crazy thing out here. You crank from your, from your, with your shoulder relaxed and crank just at your elbow. Okay? The other thing is, when I crank, I go around in a circle like this and my hand tips ever so slightly down, kind of the choo-choo train motion, where you see the, you know, the one choo-choo train moving smooth, even though the wheel's going, you know, like that. Um, you don't want to do this. Don't crank over the top and then up from the bottom and over the top and up from the bottom. There is a technique that does that, but it's, it's for coups and it's a, it's a far more advanced. So keep your hand straight, crank and play level. Don't play like this. If you start, if you catch yourself doing that, stop. Start again. Play like that. If you catch yourself doing this, stop. Start again. Recorrect yourself. Start again. So this is the other thing that, uh, that I tell people to do all the time. Take the strings off. Well, not take them off. Lift the strings of your instrument. So there's no strings on you, there's no strings making any noise on your instrument, and crank. Sit in front of a, you know, whatever, you, you're at a Netflix, and you want to watch some show for an hour, sit down, put the instrument in your lap, and crank. That's all you need to do. All you're doing is developing a smooth turn as you go around. Now, Alexis Foscher, who we talked about earlier, Alexis basically says the, the kind of the art of playing the hurdy-gurdy is to continually make a smooth circle with your hand while also adding these little punctuation points for the coups around the circle. And if you don't, if you, you go, I'm just gonna jump right in and start buzzing right away, and it, it, it's something I did and something a lot of people do, um, 
what you find out is that you tend to not make a smooth circle. You tend to like pull up from the bottom a little too hard, or you tend to, to push forward from the top a little too fast. Sit down, crank, just, uh, I actually told somebody who was, a, uh, I mentored them, told some, do that, just sit down and crank. They sent me like three weeks later, they sent me a message back and said, hey, I, somebody wanted to hear, hear me play the hurdy-gurdy. I sat down and started cranking and my husband said uh, that it sounded so much smoother now. So just do it. It's, it, you know, it's just a basic thing and you can do it. It doesn't cost you anything. You can do it while watching TV. So do that. Um, next, uh, I want you to, um, I need to look over here just to make sure. Okay. So, so now you've got the, the instrument in front of you and you're going to hold the crank here and you're going to rest your left hand on top of it. it you, when you let rest your left hand on top of the, the instrument, you'll, you'll see that if I align my shoulders, the left hand is in the middle of the key box. I mean, some of these key boxes are bigger where the left hand, like to get to the middle, you have to reach out a little bigger. That's not so critical as the, as the right. But if, if you just relax and hold the instrument, your left hand ends up in the middle your right hand ends up in line with the crank, or your right shoulder ends up in line with the crank. So uh, next, let's talk about how to hold the crank so that you can successfully uh, play the coups and do everything else. So um, one of the things, well, I'll, I'll talk about that next time. Um, so the crank uh, is this little mushroom-shaped thing. If you have a crank that, that looks like that, um, it's trash. That's a door pull. <laughs> so, uh, came on some cheap instrument that, that I, or came on an instrument I bought that somebody had put on there. I don't know why, just to like make it go around. I'm not sure, but that's a drawer pull. That's not a crank. That's a proper crank. So, um, when you, when you hold the crank, you're going to hold it. You're going to put the crank right here. So there's some, like right here, the joints on your, on your, uh, fingers. There's a little. There's a couple little bones right here, and or the, the where the joints are right there on the bones. You're going to put those right there on top of those. So just set the crank in that position, and then pinky and ring finger down, and roll your other fingers over it. That's it. So you're going to play in in that position. Okay. Now you'll notice that I've already cheated or I, I, I will cheat, and I'm going to put three fingers underneath. I've got a, like, fairly, my hands aren't huge, but my, my fingers are fat. So I have a hard time uh, playing with both of my fingers in here, so I tend to put three fingers underneath there. If that works for you, fine. Play like that. Not a problem at all. Um, uh, we immediately suggest to these two fingers over the front, your thumb over the top, like that. Okay, so that's the, that's the position of the crank when you turn. And that means that essentially you set your hand on the crank and you turn. And when you turn, you need to do so steadily and consistently. Um, and that, uh, that, once again, needs to happen with that straight arm movement. Not, the, not this, don't do wrist rotation. Um, everybody wants to. So the, I, I, I tell people, unless you're like a machinist who runs a, a, a lathe or runs a mill or something and is doing this on a daily basis or has some machine that they're, that they're cranking on a regular basis, you're going to find that, that smooth rotation is not what your body wants to do. Your body uh, is designed to throw things. It's designed to grab things. It's designed to pick things up. At no point in time does anybody ever say, I just want to, you know, pick up this rock in a circular motion. You don't reach for something by reaching for something. You, you, you just grab it. So that's where the circular motion practice comes in. And, and the other thing that happens is because your body mechanics say that if something, if you need to reach over something, you bend your wrist, like, like that. 
And so your body mechanics then say, oh, this is what you should do. Because it's, it's you know, you're just going around in circle. It's easy to do that. It is, but it's wrong. It won't allow you to play uh, consistently, and it won't allow you to buzz where you need to. So hand in this position, crank around. All right. Um, the, the, the next kind of question we get all the time is, um, wheel cover on or off? It's up to you. Uh, I find that the wheel cover kind of mutes the sound a little bit. It doesn't, like, it, it's, if I'm standing five feet away from somebody who's got a wheel cover on, I can't tell the difference, and, and they may be able to tell the difference. But um, it, it's really just a, a matter of personal preference. I don't like it on the instrument. I like to be able to see the cotton while I'm playing. I like to be able to see, you know, that there's an interaction happening uh, underneath this wheel cover and I want to make sure it's there uh, you know make sure the cotton's not there it's not too thin or I'm not getting some weird things uh, you know a bug didn't land on the wheel and now I'm getting weird noises whatever um, so uh, so it's, it's really up to you wheel cover on or off the, the other thing is the the wheel covers often have a, a tiny little hole on them and they have a string on them and they hang down below uh, while you're playing um, and it's that is that's really just because um someplace throughout europe in a closet somewhere there are five thousand wheel covers with no hurdy-gurdies to go with them because people take the wheel covers off and they set them aside and then they walk away and they get home and they go oh where the hell's my wheel cover and then you know it's gone you got another one made or it's you know off in the ether or whatever so they tied the wheel covers to the instruments so that they don't go away. I think it's terribly distracting for me. I don't like the wheel cover to be banging up against my knee while I'm playing. So um, I take the wheel cover off and I always, always, always put it in the case. If you don't have a case, put it someplace you know you're going to find it. I, I, this Reboyo back here, that currently does not have a wheel cover, you can see back there. That Reboyo, I lost the wheel cover to that in my house. I have no idea where it is. It, it didn't, didn't fit on the instrument, so it would fall off. I have no idea. It's gone. I've checked the whole house, can't find it. It's never, it hasn't been out of the house without the wheel, on, wheel cover on it. Always someplace you know you're going to be able to find it. So otherwise, you know, you're, you're going to, you're likely to lose it. So wheel cover is important. Um, on or off depends on you. Um, so, uh, okay. So, you, you know, we talked in initially at the beginning about knowing which strings are tuned to what, and that's important because you need to tune your instrument. And in order to tune your instrument, you know, you need to know what's, tune you're going to, you know, what tuning you're going to have for. So the, the way that you should tune your instrument, and this is the problem that, that a lot of beginners have, have because they, they start out and they want to, they want to play the instrument. They want to tune it right away uh, and they want to, you know, get to work on it. Um, but they, um, uh, but they're not quite sure um, where they, you know, where the, the point is that they need to, to how they how do they need to tune it? So what they what they do is they they put it on they start cranking um, and they're not sure what the tuning is they crank and sometimes they break a string or sometimes they're not quite clear on what it is they need to do. So this that's important that's why in the beginning I say know your tunings know your know which pegs are going to adjust which strings because when you tune you need to tune one string and then tune all of the other strings to that string. You don't put the string on and take it off again. You only tune the string to the other string or the other strings to that one particular string. So that seems like, well, you know, that's, it's, uh, it, it's easier if I lift it off and, and play it. When you lift the string, you stretch the string. When you stretch the string, you it's out of tune. It's, it's just, there's no two ways about it. You just can't lift a string off the wheel and still have it remain in tune. Even just, a, you know, just a little bit makes a big difference in the overall sound. And especially if you do that for every string and you're gonna say, like this one, I'll put four strings on, 
to play. If you do that for every string, that means you have four different tunings that you're trying to match together that sound terrible because they're, they're just enough off that it sounds like you're playing in mud. So first thing to do is tune the string. I've got these great little, I don't know if you can see it. I've got these great little tuners by Diodario. Um, and they are uh, guitar tuners. I think it's probably fuzzy. Uh, but they're guitar tuners. And what I do is I put them underneath the, the tail, put a little earthquake tack underneath that, or blue tack, squeeze it down and leave it on there. You, you can put it in the case with that tuner on it. No problem. Tuners are like $14. Um, and they can stay with the instrument. You don't have to have your phone. You don't have to have some big external tuners. These things work great. And they, you, you can get them all day long. I think I have... I got seven of them over there on a on, a, on my shelf just to, for all of the other instruments. When I get those completed, they, they put a new tuner on them. So they just just to know they're they're super easy to have and tune, they tune perfectly. So I'm gonna tune first string. So the first string is in D. Um, the the important thing for this is uh, for tuning is if you're not sure. Um, if the tuning's a little high, you don't want to tune down to pitch. You want to tune below pitch and come up to pitch. Never start high and go to pitch because what's going to happen is that you've already stretched the string. When you stretch it, when you, when you relieve the pressure on it, it's going to go to pitch. And as soon as you stop with that and you start playing, it's going to keep kind of slow, slowly going out of tune. If you tune it down, you've taken all the, you've taken the, you know, you've added all the slack to the string, and then you tune it up to pitch, that adds the, the tuning so that it's right where you want it, and it should stay there, but string stretch, so they're going to move around. But just, just be aware, always low to pitch, never high down to pitch. Okay, so when I said you only put one string on, and then you're done with your tuner. Now... I'm done with my tuner. Now I can I can use the tuner to tune tangents, but I'm done with my tuner otherwise. So now I'm going to tune the the second string. This is it's a D octave instrument, which is typical for French instruments. It means that this is a the first string I try the first string I put on was a high D. It's a it's you know it's what we refer to as the high D. Um, it's an octave above the one I just put on. So that string I'm going to down tune it. it up to pitch and I'm matching the pitch so that both even though they're two different octaves that they come together and they line up perfectly now the way that you do that is not to listen to the pitch and it seems strange but every bagpiper out here anybody who plays bagpipe will know this and that is you don't listen to the tuning just ignore the tuning completely you listen to this sound that happens when they're out of tune. So the way that the, the way that music moves, the way sound moves is in waves and compare, uh, compatible waves have the same, one will be, you know, half the, the, the wavelength of the other one. So, you know, two little bumps on the wavelength will meet, meet one uh, other pitch. So essentially um, they, they should fall at exactly the same spot. What happened in terms of, you know, how, how you get the tune in. Um, what happens is if, if one is a little flat or it's a little sharp, you, if you're not listening to the pitch, what you'll hear is you'll hear this little wah, 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 wah sound. The more you hear that wah, 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 wah sound, the faster it is, the farther apart the tuning is. So now if you've got, you know, your high, you've got a high string here and your other one, you're trying to tune it up. If it's going wah, 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 it's way over there, way out of pitch. And then if, as you bring it up, it goes wah, 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 and that's it. That's the pitch you want. Just listen. Don't listen for the, don't listen for the note. Listen for the difference in the note to get it on pitch. Um, once you do that, so I tend to do melody strings first, and then I do the trumpet.
It's a little difficult with cans on your head. And then I do the drone. Now, if you listen, I, I've got a mic, so hopefully everybody can kind of hear it clearly. If you listen, you can hear the 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 fact that the the the, the pitch is off. You can hear the the drone going whoa, crazily vibrating away. Okay, so now everything's in line, close enough for, for human ears. Um, and you're gonna need to do that more than once. Um, over time, what happens is, you know, you sit down, you play the instrument, the instrument warms up, the, the, the instrument moves, the, the, the strings are, are become excited, they start, they, they start stretching out a little bit, you just, just readjust your tuning. Don't, um, don't be afraid to, to, to make the changes to make it sound good. Um, the, the, uh, I'm going to have to say this delicately. Um, there are some people that have posted videos of them playing their new instrument and it is not in tune. Like it's drastically out of tune. <clears throat> um, the, 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 no, nobody's going to go, oh, you're terrible. You suck. But they are going to go, you need to work on your tuning. And it's, just so you know, it's not like you're a terrible person or you don't know what you're doing. It, they, they're trying to help you. They're trying to say, you need to get those, that tuning in line. You can't tune your instrument on the tuner. You have to develop an ear. The only way to develop an ear is play and do it again and again and again and again. Uh, you know, um, like I said, bagpipe players, they all know this. They, you gotta, you know, they stick the drone up next to their head. They're playing the chanter. They're trying to hear the, the, the tune. They're trying to hear the, the tuning of the instrument. They've got to, I mean, you don't have to reach behind your head to adjust anything on a hurdy-gurdy. Bagpipe players are always constantly like this, or they've got somebody else who's in the back, like, you know, making adjustments on their, their drones. Just, you know, just pay attention to when your instrument's, uh, when, when your instrument's happy, when it sounds right for you. If, if it's a little off, it's going to be muddy. If it's a lot off, it's going to sound bad. Um, if you've got, you know, some people are like, I really like this, you know, fourth tuning thing. It's, it's this uh, medieval sound. It's not. The medieval sound is, doesn't exist. That, that, that's a thing that they made up in a movie, and it's something that everybody's gone, oh, yes, we have to do these fourths apart, do these fifths apart. Or it's not the truth. Just tune to one tuning and 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 everything will go easy um so as far as to the tr tuning on your instrument that's where you need to talk to your luthier you need to find out what they did in order to tune to, in order to get the pitches on your instrument in the way that they did and what tuning each string is and then what string goes to what peg and that way you don't break any strings you are confident in the fact that you know how to to make the adjustments and you can, and over time, you can hear the adjustments. So work on that. Um, that's vitally important. You, it, to, in order to view, for you to be happy to play, be uh, playing and really be happy with the, the sound of your instrument, um, you're really going to want, um, you're really going to want it to match. You're really going to want it to have this great, you know, overall sound. And that overall sound is going to be far more pleasant when it's dead perfect in tune you're going to be you're going to be like wow well, you know if you're playing something that's out of tune you somebody you know hands you a an instrument that's perfectly in tune you're just like wow why doesn't mine sound like this tune um okay so uh there's lots of parts hurdy gurdies have lots of parts <laughs> what did, uh, was it 340 uh, parts um so uh that means that there's a lot of adjustment, but uh, the, there's the, the, the adjustment that you need to make in, in, for pressure and everything else on the wheel, that's the next class. The adjustment that you want that is part of this 
you know, aspect of I've sat down, I've got the instrument in front of me, I'm going to start making these adjustments. The last one is this Tirant. Now, um, in the in the in the hurdy gurdy world, you've got keys and you've got tangents and you've got the dog or the chien or the snare. You've got the drones. Uh, you've got uh, melody. These are melody strings, chanter strings. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're, there's a bunch of different names for all of this stuff. This, and, and unless the, I have not seen the German for this, but I, I only know people referring to this as a tirant. So when I talk about a tirant, I'm talking about this peg. When I talk about the tirant string, I'm talking about the string that leads from that peg to the, mel to the trumpet, and the trumpet is this string that rests on your shin. So that where your shin sits or your dog sits, this is the trumpet, this is the, the uh, tirant string, and this is the tirant peg, okay? Okay, right. so when you adjust the tirant peg, um, you want to crank playing speed. So this is the other thing that I need to, I need to clarify. All of this is done at playing speed. Don't do this. Don't do the... Don't do that. Crank. Make the adjustment. Be confident in the fact that you can do it. Just crank away. Don't, don't, like, you know... Uh, don't don't slow this hand down because this hand is moving. It, it's I, I got to tell you that I did it. Everybody that I've seen who starts has done it. They this hand is going, especially when they first sit down. This hand is going. They start making the adjustment, and this hand comes to a stop. Like you you, you can't adjust the string while while not bowing, but the hand just stops or it just goes like super slow. Play it playing, crank it playing speed. So in order to crank at playing speed, you just got to go a little faster, right? Um, well, the tirant is adjusted based on how fast you play and where you put the rhythm. So if I play, if I crank at playing speed, I turn the tirant up. It's buzzing now. It buzzes a lot. If I turn it down, it doesn't buzz unless I want it to. And the way that I adjust that adjustments as I go. So if I want it to be really, well, kind of really present, I'll crank it up a little more. Um, if I don't want it to be really present, I want it to be uh, really what they call too sec, I'll turn it down. So, um, that's how you adjust your tirant. Turn it and make the adjustment as you're playing. Don't, don't adjust it without cranking, and don't adjust it without cranking at speed. What happens is if you crank it slower, you adjust it, and then when you start playing, so if I do really slow, and then I start playing, because I started slow, it's going to do that. So don't do that. Playing speed, make the adjustment. Okay, so that is, those are the adjustments you're going to need to make, like immediately just sitting down, strapping on the instrument, getting it lined up, putting your hand on the crank in the right position, putting your he left hand on the, on the key box. We'll talk about that when we go to the, the playing portion of it. Um, left hand on the key box, and then adjust the, the tuning of the strings, adjust the, the uh, tirant, and it, we'll talk about the adjustments of the tangents as well. That's it's actually a, a, a vital part of this. So we'll talk about the adjustments of the, the tangents, but, um, uh, but that's just the, okay, I've sat down, I have the instrument, this is when, how I'm, I'm just about to be ready to play, here's where I am, okay? Um, really quick, uh, as a side thing, um, the, the, uh, you're going to need tools. No two ways about it, you're going to need tools. So the tools that you're going to want, and when, when I say tools, I mean they could, they're virtually 
Okay. So, I have a bag, and almost every hurdy gurdy player does. Um, so, I used to do the Renaissance Fair. This is a Renaissance Fair bag. You can find them online. They are all over the place. It's got a, a big open pocket and a little pocket in the back where I keep some stuff. Anything will work. May, I've got the makeup bags. I've got a little pencil bags. I've got these like just little things like that. that whatever you need um, to store your stuff that is going to be big enough for your needs, grab one of those. Um, in that bag, you're going to want cotton. Now this is various different types of cotton. Cotton probably from a, a medical, you know, pill jar. Uh, there's uh, that silk. Um, this is long staple cotton called Sliver. You can get at a weaving store. There is this, um, there's this brown cotton, like it's unbleached raw cotton. Um, there is uh, stuff called Bure that, uh, that, um, uh, Neil Brook uh, talks about and sell or, or ships with his instrument. It's it's a uh, it's bamboo and rayon mixed together. It's just carted together. Uh, there's boo ray. You're going to use the cotton. It's going to work best for you. Um, I use long staple cotton uh, that I get. Uh, you can buy. I think it costs twelve dollars for like a, a four and eight ounce bag, which is like a small pillow. It's they're, they're like you may never need cotton again if you buy this. So. Um, the, you, you can use, uh, and there are, uh, I know that, uh, that there are players that keep tampons in their bag just to make sure that they have cotton, they can rip it all apart and pull it out. The only problem with the, some of the, the chemically processed and, and machine processed uh, cotton, like tampons being one of them and, and uh, pill bottle cotton, uh, that is that they get these little pills in them. They get the little, like, uh, uh, um, they, they, they're not... They're not clean when you pull them apart. You can see like little like bunchy spots in them. Um, it, they, they work fine. Uh, you just got to learn how to kind of pick out some of the bigger uh, pills in the, in, the, uh, in the cotton. But just, you know, any, anything will work there. Um, but you're going to want cotton in the bag. You're going to want rosin. Um, there is an, an endless, well, not endless. There's a, there's a lot of suppliers of rosin. Cake rosin, no. Not cheap violin rosin. Not the kind that you get that has the two little wooden borders on the side. Um, don't get that. Uh, only because it, it's, it's rosin, it'll still work. Um, but that, the, the cheap stuff with the you know, little wooden wedge stuff, um, you've got to get it perfectly lined up on your wheel and it's, you can't really use it to, to cotton the, to, or to, to put rosin on the strings. Um, which we'll learn later. Um, so just to get a good rosin, we, I, I use Kaplan rosin. Um, it's, I don't know, I think I buy it, two of them for like 20 bucks or something. It's got this cool little spring mechanism so that you can close it up and it protects itself and you can look like you're, you know, talking on the phone. Um, but, uh, and it's, and it's, uh, it's called dustless rosin because it, it doesn't tend to, dust out nearly as much as the other types do, it still produces some dust. Um, you know, just anything that works. This is a dark rosin, by the way. Um, dark rosins are stickier, but uh, you don't want to use the green cello rosin. Um, and and I need to do a little more research, but I think the green cello rosin has some paraffin in it, and you don't want to wax anything on your wheel. Never put anything that's not pure rosin on the wheel, uh, except for liquid rosin, which is wafts off and then it's just rosin. So don't just make sure that you've got, you know, a good, a good cake rosin. They're cheap. You can get them online. You can get them from your local, uh, uh, um, violin store, any place that, that carries it, you'll be happy with it. Um, flat end wrench, flat end. These don't have any teeth in them. Some of them do. Um, this is for turning tangents, especially wooden tangents when they get sticky. These work great. Uh, you're going to want forceps. Um, forceps are really great for getting into places that you can't get in. 
you know, just little medical forceps. Um, they they work out really well if for changing strings. This is like if you need to get into where change strings, this is the way you need to do it. Um, you should have whatever if you've got screws. If you've got bolts, if you've got whatever it is on your instrument, a little, a little screwdriver that has swappable ends that you can get anywhere cheap, um, that has the tools that you need, should be in your bag. All of the tools for every one of the adjustable parts of your instrument should be in your bag. Um, and the last thing, if you have some sympathetic strings, you're going to want a sympathetic string tuner. Um, it's just a, got a little slot in the end, and it's just a little, this one's one I made, but they, they have them really simple ones that are just a little stick, a little metal piece with a slot in it and a, and a stick across the top. So the sympathetic string tuners, you're going to want one of those. We'll talk about tuning all that stuff later. Uh, and I think that is it for what you need. So let's, uh, questions. Let's go to questions. Anybody have anything? I, I can't, like I said, I can't see the chat, so I'm going to... Where are you getting your cotton? Um, I, got, I just get mine online. I found a, a supplier that just does, um, we, uh, just a weaving supplier uh, that does... You, you want to look up Cotton Sliver, uh, S-L-I-V-E-R, um, and uh, there's lots of options. There's, you know, the, the stuff you want uh, in general is called long staple. It just means that the that the the cotton itself when they when they pull it off of the 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 bulb it is is longer there's a there's a regular standard staple which is a little shorter but this one's just a little longer it just makes uh the the it makes when you when you pull the cotton apart it makes it nice and smooth as opposed to too bunchy so alexa had a question earlier about Tuning. Um, she asks, so the trumpet is tuned to be the same octave as a high D, and the bass drone is one or two octaves lower than the high D? Correct. So like, how do, you, how do you want your strings to coordinate? I guess it would depend on the instrument. It depends on the instrument. Yeah, absolutely depends on the instrument. Um, there is a push now. Uh, no, I can't say push. Uh, there is a, 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 a tendency um, for makers to make these... Uh, um, deeper sounding instruments. So the, like where I'm playing a, a, a high D, that is, is or, or, you know, if I were to put the G on this, that would be considered the high G on some instruments. This is, you know, where I would consider they put unison Gs on it so I can play it. A lot of them are going into this uh, octave tuning for G and, uh, and lower and lower strings. And they've got a great sound. You don't have to adjust them so much because the, the, the bass strings tend to, to um, uh, take a lot more like pressure against the wheel and they, they're more forgiving. So the makers make these you know, easily more forgiving instruments because the, they put these strings on them. But even then, um, you wanna know what tuning, I actually talk to your luthier, you need to know what tuning he set the strings up at. So in, in this case, I, and I get this wrong all the time, um, I think I'm in D4, D4, the other one is in D3, the trumpet is in D3 uh, as well. The, the, there are two D drones, one is the, the, there's the petite and the gros bourdon, petite, small, gros, fat. Um, and it's a D2 and a D1, I think. Uh, it, I get this wrong. And, it's even more confusing when you use like the German versus the whatever French thing because the numbers di differ. Um, I have a question about getting strings. Um, yes. I have gotten some gut strings from Aquila here in the U.S. Yep. And um, but I wasn't sure about gauge. I managed to get some that worked by guessing but the guy wasn't able to help me either and he wasn't really familiar with hurdy-gurdy it's like how do you know what density of string to do for like my meal brook is in octave g i've right. been screwing around trying to find a decent octave upper g for it for a long time and do i have to get strings from neil 
I've I've emailed Savarez and they've never gotten back to me. I mean, it's it's kind of a crapshoot, and I want a chart. Damn it! <laughs> I want well, a chart I can follow. Here's the here's the th here's the good thing. Um, so uh, Neil will tell you. Neil Neil definitely will have a have a an idea. You know, he'll be able to say, yeah, this is. It, if it's a G and it's a gut string, it's likely a 94, 0.94. Um, it, they, they go from 0.94 to 1.0, yeah, 1.08. Uh, and it depends on the presence of the string. The thicker the string over the same length makes the string louder and makes, the, makes it more present because it, the thicker string gets up to tension faster in terms of like, um, if you, you, it basically, a thicker string is, is, has more tension on it and therefore puts more tension on the bridge. But sometimes that's a bad thing. Um, and and it, it means that you, like, where a 94 might sound really clean and clear, a 104, you're gonna hear every little scritch and scratch of the entire wheel as it goes around. So start with a 94, but the way to do this, and because she's got it all, everything written down, and she, she can even send you a chart if you ask for one, uh, Maison de Vieille Rue, um, uh, de, la, de la Vieille Rue, uh, in, in France. So the Maison, the, the house of the hurdy-gurdy, the house, uh, house of the Vieille Rue, uh, French for hurdy-gurdy. Um, she, uh, there's a, uh, there's a, another, uh, she used to be associated with a, 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 a guy that is on the hurdy-gurdy community, uh, uh, um, Maison Mangenot. Um, and so Maison Vieille Maison Mangenot used to be kind of, you know, partners. I, I guess they, they're they not partners anymore, but she still sells strings and they can get you strings. Otherwise, um, any good luthier, especially a good European luthier, will have all of those strings in stock. They, you, call, you can send them a text, send them, sorry, send them an email and just say, hey, I want these strings they'll provide you with strings. You can go online, you can look it up. There's, I think there's a link right there for Maison uh, Vieille Rue. Um, but there's other, there's other links. There's, um, yeah, hurdy, there's a suggestion for hurdygurdy.org on the strings. Uh, and it says Neil has a string chart on his website. Uh, there's also, there's a, a discussion on strings um, with a, a while back with Toby, Toby Miller. Um, and she likes these strings that are that are made in Paris, or they're made. They're, they're you can buy them in Paris. I don't know exactly where they're made, but um, uh, but they're they're same. They're same. It's a it's a gut string. Um, you just want to balance the string based on your needs. So uh, there's a maker. I think he's in. I think he's in Canada now. I think he moved north. Um, uh, but a uh, gamut strings. G A M U T. Um, they, he sells uh, strings and it, what you need to do as far as a gut string is you need to know what type of string you want. There's sheep gut, there's, there's uh, bovine gut. And um, the, there's those strings uh, and, and the way that they're finished can play differently based, they can be the exact same size, but they can, base, they can play differently based on the finish on them. So the Savarez strings you're looking for as far as the, the hurdy-gurdy ones are generally lacquered strings or oil gut strings, they call them. Um, and they're, they're oil finished so that they're, they're kind of hard. Uh, if, if you take one and try to twist it, it, it kinks. It doesn't like roll up. Whereas a gamut string may roll on, you may be able to just roll it. So um, that, just pay attention to that. And then as far as the, you know, like a, the, the octave strings, it's almost always gonna be a viola string uh, of one way or another, of one type or another. Um, and, uh, and then you just need to talk to your maker, but really string length is important. And then the, the note that you want to, to, uh, and I, I have my, where is it? Oh, this is my kind of, when somebody says, what string do I want? Uh, I always tell them, you know, solve that equation and that'll give you the string that you want. So if you if you're math savvy, you can go online and solve that. You can solve the equation, or you can talk to your luthier. So, uh, um, and I, I just found that online. It talks about the, um, the, 
you know how to how to get the right string for the for your needs. Okay, more questions. John, when you make doing my amplification, how do you recommend the amp the amp electronics? I'm sorry. Hold on a second. I got to turn my headset up. Okay. Okay. Say it again. Electronics. What kind of electronics? Where? Oh, he what kind of electronics? Okay. Yeah. He was asking about what kind of electronics and where to get and them. And where would you put them? Where would you oh, put them? Okay. So um, it, it depends. So if you're building an instrument, uh, it depends on what you want. There's, there's, uh, there's, um, uh, oh God, uh, K and K, the K and K, uh, uh, um, PZO electronic pickups. Uh, that, that's the one that most people defer to. They just go, ah, it's just get a K and K. You just got to get the right, you know, length on the cable for the for the output on the jack. Um, but then you have to decide: do you want a K and K that's that's stereo? Do you want it's mono? You, you know, it's so uh, just the, the people at K and K can help you. But also, um, the the other way to do it is to just simply get a microphone um, and. Uh, I'll, I'll try to grab the mic here I've got over there, but uh, it's, I use a, I think it's a, what is it, Audiotronics? I, I can't remember the name of it right now, um, but who makes it? But it's a, it's a standard one that everybody's using now, it, and it's just a gooseneck microphone. You clip it to the tailpiece, it goosenecks over, and you set it, as far as just a pickup microphone, you set it right there, kind of right in between the drones and the main bridge. And that'll help you pick up kind of all of those sounds uh, if you kind of aim it right there in that direction. Um, I talked to K and K, and they I, I got a blue in mind. They said they didn't know where. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, most people don't. So I, that's that's where you go with that one. Uh, and then as far as as far as inside a hurdy gurdy, um, it has been basically discussed and talked about and where do you put it and it it seems like right here so that this is the back of the instrument there's the wheel this is the drone side of the of the instrument right there right on the this brace kind of just off of where the wheel passes right. through right there and that's that that's a good place for a single pickup if you're going to use a single pickup um uh, the there's lots of instruments that have multiple pickups in them um, my my um, Weichselbomber has uh, a pickup for every, uh, and and uh, I think I've got another boudet over here. It's got a pickup for every um, part of the instrument. So there's a, a a metal pickup, a wound pickup for the sympathetic strings because they're metal. There's a uh, piezo electric underneath the or within the or attached to the the main bridge. There's one that's attached to the trumpet and one that's attached to the drone. And then you can, they, they tend to just, uh, th those tend to have like a, a, a XLR outputs so that you can individually select each one of them. Uh, my uh, Weichselbummer has a has a mixer on the side so you can individually mix them. The, the Boudet that's uh, R.T. Taylor's, who's over here somewhere, um, he has the same thing. It's just knobs on the top and they each individually select. But if you're just looking for a single like quarter inch output on that brace portion or just use the gooseneck, the gooseneck is kind of the, the, the straightforward, easiest way to do it. And the sound is really good. Thank you, that is wondering because I've been trying to talk and maybe put one on the bridge and one underneath. Uh, you, if you put, one, you put one on the bridge, um, you want to put it on the side of the bridge, not like, or, you know, not, not, not in the middle, um, not someplace in the middle. There's too much free movement on the side. It's a little, little, it picks up the sound. Well, put it on the drone side, put it on the base or side, whatever side has got the base on it, put it on the side that's got the base. Um, because the, the, the vibration from the higher note will travel faster to get to the, the, the pickup. The, the other thing is, um, if you, you want to put just one on that bridge, if you're going to put one inside the body, uh, you don't want to combine the two because the one inside the body is going to pick up, you're going to double pick up that main bridge. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. That explains something. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. Okay. What else? Anybody? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
So there's a lot of questions I'm working on. So um, okay, the this the tuning for taking the strings on and off. I, I just saw one about what you know when you take the strings on and off and how do you tune them. And I thought you wanted to be able to do that. The you only do that. Um, you only like remove a string and put a string back on during a performance. Um, if you're playing in general, uh, if, if you just want to play with a single string, you can play with a single string, but when you put the other strings back on, you're going to have to tune them again. Um, if you're in a performance and you, you know, there's, there's all these cool like rotational or, or push capos or push lifters now where you can just lift the, the strings by pushing on a, pushing on a, 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 a lifter thing or rotating a thing. But every time you take a string off the wheel and it lift it, you've stretched it. So as soon as you put it back down again, it's going to be out of tune. Whether it's out of tune like just a few cents or whether it's out of tune like drastically depends on the string and depends on the instrument. But even a few cents uh, of, uh, of, of being off can make the instrument sound muddy. So that's why I say when you put the string on, put the string on, tune it, then put the next string on and tune that one to the first one. Don't take the first one off and then tune the second one. Leave the first one on and listen to the first one while you tune the second one. Um, and the same for drums. Everything, all the strings on at the same time. And that'll stop that, that, that you know, I've lifted a string and now it's too flat or too, you know, whatever. Uh, and I put it back on again. And, and I, if, if you can't hear the difference um, when you take a string off and put it back on again, down tune and then bring it back up to pitch again. And you can do it really quick, just down and come back, come back up slow, and you come right back and you get it in line again. Uh, that'll clean up the sound, but also that's the way you want to do it. It's kind of, you know, um, uh, it's, it's just the standard thing. Now, if you take the strings off while you're playing, when you put them back on, even in a performance, they'll, they'll, they'll drop them back on, and you can hear sometimes that they're out of tune. Other times, you, they've, um, I've seen, I think, uh, Gulliam Desk does it. I think it's Gulliam? I, I probably was going to murder his name. Um, he does it where he puts a string back on. And I think um, when he's doing that, he's up tuning the string so that when he drops it on, it is in pitch. Um, but it's because he knows his instrument. He's played for, you know, a long time. Um, and But other times I've heard him take one off and put it back on again. And it's not in pitch anymore. So... Uh, so yeah, I and mean, performance-wise, you can do it. And yes, you can take all the strings off and just you know play one string. That's fine. But when you play all the strings, you don't want to lift them up individually to tune them uh, before you put them all back down again. Okay. Uh, more questions. I'm looking at the chat, by the way, if anybody's. Well, if you're tuning the two main ones to D. Yes. You're saying that even the drones and the dog string are all tuned to D. Uh, in a DG, yes. Yes, in general. Um, so uh, on a GC instrument, um, the, and it, okay, once again, depends on your luthier. Uh, it depends on your instrument. But on a typical GC instrument, it's the two melody strings are G. There's a drone string in G. There's a drone string, string in C. Usually it's the... Uh, Low drone, the extra low drone is in G, and the, the mid drone is in C. Your trumpet um, is tuned generally to C, and you can up tune it to D if you're going to play in the key of C. Um, I have on occasion just taken that string, that C string, off and replaced it with a string that I know I can play in G, because G and G go together. There's not, you can't play. You, the, you can't play a song, you can't play a tune uh, that the G won't match on your G instrument. Um, and then the moosh, which is that, that funky little one that's above the, the uh, trumpet, um, that's usually a, a fourth. So if this instrument is in D and G, because it's got three strings, so I've got two D strings and one in G. The moosh is generally, on a regular six-string instrument, the moosh is generally the fourth. So this will be in G, 
while all of the other strings are in D. Now, I say that uh, knowing the fact that I have got a number of instruments that don't even have a mush on them. That, that I, nobody plays them. Well, rarely plays them, I should say. About 99% of the time, nobody's playing the moosh. Um, my friend Curtis buys a moosh, puts the string on, uh, and only uses the string to keep the, the cuff from his shirt from resting on the trumpet down below. He doesn't, and I've never seen him use one. So just th that's the way that tuning works. In D, they're all in D, uh, except for the moosh, which is in G. All right, I was told, and I was told wrong. I was told that if, those, if the two main ones are in D, the drones are in G. That's why it's a DG. <laughs> oh, no, that's, yeah, that's, that's wrong. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. So the, I have the, I have two dogs, so I have one in G and one in A. Oh, one in G and one in A. Okay, so the yeah, the A is the fifth of the of the D, so that's fine. Um, but if you've got one in G, uh, you've got one in D and one in A, G and A. Yeah. I would get one in G and one in D. Okay. I'd swap out that string to a D, and then okay. swap out the drones to Ds, um, because <laughs> it, it works out like this. It, it, if you're I have played tunes in C uh, on my D instrument. It doesn't always sound great with the drones, um, but I've played it and it, you know, technically it's still, everything's still in tune as far as that goes. But when, you're, when your drones are not um, compatible with the scale that you're playing, every time you start playing the scale, the drones sound off. So the best way to do that, as far as um, as far as most instruments go, is just take all of the strings, make all of the strings the same tuning. Um, it's difficult to do with the GC on the G trumpet because the uh, it's either kind of really scritchy and sharp, or it's really low and and bassy, and it doesn't quite have the quality that you you'd expect. I, I've I've swapped mine out, put. Uh, nylon B strings from a, a nylon guitar uh, on there and stretched out. The nylon strings, by the way, um, they, they're, they're meant to be plucked. They're not meant to be bowed. So anytime you put a nylon string on a, on a bowed instrument, it does not in any way respond the way that a bowed string should, should respond. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank okay. you. More questions? Anyone? I want to look at you. Yeah. Why, okay. is, why is there a moosh if nobody plays it? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. There's a moosh on them because. Is it out the string tension all for the overall tension on the instrument? Or what? I, you know, I it's well, because I've had some, and I, I think this one, that, that one over there just hasn't had a moosh on it probably 100 years. Um, I don't think it really does. I think that the moosh was really uh, initially put on to be um, to be played with very specific music, um, and they want that fourth, you know, that 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 fourth in the in the sound. Um, and if you're playing something in D and you put the moosh on in G, it sounds okay. If you had it, it allows you to have a. a a G drone on a D instrument, but um, it, it's 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 very specific and it's almost like you know um, it, it's just unnecessary. You don't need to have it, but they're on there all the time. And I think really because they had to build the bridge, they just put a string on it. You know, it's one of those things. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, could I could I quickly ask between playing sessions? Like when you put it, you heard a good away overnight. Do yeah. you leave the strings on the wheel, or do yes. you lift them off? No, I leave you them. Just off. leave them off. Yeah, yeah. There's no harm in it. Um, okay. Now, I say that for wood wood instruments. I don't know. Like there's there's now there's some the instruments that have I, I call it composite because it could be anything. Um, uh, but it could be a plastic wheel, could be a, a polymer wheel, could be a, a wood, you know, a MDF wheel. Um, it, it's just if you play your instrument and you set it down and you notice the next day it's got weird funky like you know spots on the wheel that that seem to catch it's 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 going to fix itself over time but it's um, but it, it you know if there's got a high spot in the rosin or whatever 
then lift your then rip your strings off. But most of the time, the instrument's designed to have its strings on it. Now, there are one exception that I'm not aware of because I, I am not familiar directly with the instrument at all, or the wheel at all, is the Wolfgang Weichselbalmer wheel that has a soft surface on it. You don't need cotton on the string. Uh, you don't need, I don't even know if they rosin the wheel. I'm not sure how the whole system works because I have, you know, only very, very minimal experience with it. Um, but that one you would want to talk to Wolfgang about. Should you leave those strings on? Is it going to leave a little depression in the soft material that he uses? Um, but otherwise, if it's a wood wheel or it's just a composite, don't even bother. It's fine. Just leave the strings on. We got more? Scott, since Mike moved away from Indianapolis, we don't have a local teacher that I know of in Indiana. Uh, I think I don't know if Tomas teaches or I don't think Tomas teaches. I, I well, I don't think he teaches, but I think if you asked him, he'd teach you. I, th I think yeah, if you asked, he would. Um, you know, he's the reason we got into it. Yeah, I, he's a, and he's a really reasonable guy. I mean, he'll help I mean, you out. I mean, he's I, a, I make him the blame. That's what we got to do. That's what I see him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he probably accepts it happily. Yes, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. Uh, uh, Tom is a really great guy, and I, and like I said, I think if you if you talk to Tom, he'd be more than happy to to give you lessons. You know. Uh, yeah, and um, oh, oh, uh, I was thinking of somebody else there, and I I think he's well, I think he's in Bloomington too, or out there in in Indiana, but. Uh, I, I couldn't remember whether he went to Oregon. I think he went to Oregon for a while. Anyway, not e either way. One way or the other, talk to Tom. He might be able to help you out. Okay. Any more questions? I'm going to keep reading what's hey, going Hey, Scott? On. Yes. Hey, Scott. Uh, uh, what strings do you recommend for the sympathetic strings? Oh, okay. Um, that depends. Once again, back to de de depending. Um, when I use the, so on the, on like an older instrument, uh, say this one, where it's got these just straightforward, I don't know if you can see them there, um, straightforward sympathetic strings. Uh, those strings I use uh, because of my good friend Curtis Barak, I use harpsichord strings and I oh. tend to use uh, 0.9 to 0.11. Or so point so point not point point oh nine to point one one, um, but you can get those strings there. I know that, like uh, I I think these strings which are on the this boudet, um, maybe it's hard to tell because there's some wound strings on them. They may be um, uh, like a short scale mandolin. Mm, mandolin. Yeah. Nice. So, and the same, like, I know that uh, um, uh, Valentin Clostrier, uh, his, uh, the strings on his uh, Weichselbaumer that he uses are uh, sitar strings. He, he, he wanted the sitar sound, so he got sitar strings on it. I'm using guitar ones. <laughs> yeah. Metal his, guitar ones. Yeah, guitars, his... guitars are too heavy. They, you know, yeah. they don't, the, the, the thing is that the way the sympathetic strings move uh, is that it's just, you know, literally sympathetic with the vibration of the, of the instrument. Um, and the finer they are, the more easily they move. So mm -hmm. if you put yeah. heavier strings on it, you really need to get like a really heavy bass uh, drone to make those bigger strings move. Otherwise, they right. just sit there. Yeah, they don't do anything. Also, where did you get your shirt from? Is <laughs> I, I wish I could remember the guy's name. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, but Hurdy Gurdy Community. I found it on the Hurdy Gurdy Community. Okay. Uh, okay. I, nice. I ended up buying two of them uh, because they were so awesome. One for thinner summer things. But he, I think he just had it on his. Um, uh, he just, you know, went to a, a, a one of those T-shirt making shops, and you could just order from them, um, and it was his design. So uh, but cool. Somebody, yeah, somebody, somebody will know. Uh, I, I'm. You know, I got a bunch of hurdy gurdy stuff jammed in my head, so I don't remember people's names. Okay, so, uh, I gotta go now, but is the record gonna be up somewhere after this? 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna re once we get the recordings, uh, you know, kind of filtered out and cleaned up. Uh, I'm just gonna post them up. We'll post them up on YouTube, and I'll put a uh, a link for the all of the different courses on uh, the Hurdy Goody website. Okay. okay. Great. Great. Thank you so much. I gotta go now. So. Okay. It was <laughs> amazing. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Have a good Have a good day. Good day. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I did see one more question in chat. Um, you you talked a lot about correct positioning of the right hand and the right arm, um, but they want to know about the left arm. Ah. Because I know RT is always like, get your shoulder up, Courtney. Don't don't let it droop. So yeah. What are, what are your thoughts on left hand position? Well, uh, I'm going to go through that with playing, but I'm but also, um, is essentially this. <laughs> Just you you don't want. Um, there, so there's the there's the other thing that there where uh, people are lifting their elbows up, um, and that's really fast. Like it's super super good. Uh, the, uh, there's this this player Benjamin in in France that I mean his he looks like he's doing this while he's playing. Um, he's super fast. He's a really great player. Has fingers that are about that long though. Um, but uh, the I can't do that because my you know my arthritis, my shoulders won't allow me to hold my arm up like that. I can't even ride a motorcycle anymore because my arms, like, can't put my arms out that long. Um, so I tend to just relax my elbow and play. Uh, other people will tell you to lift your, you lift your elbow up. It's kind of hard on your shoulder. Um, so if you have any shoulder problems at all, or if you start feeling the stress in your shoulder, just drop your elbow again. Um, the, the idea is to not, is to play the instrument, but don't be in pain while you're doing it. It's just not, you know, if you if you if you're in pain, you're just you're not going to want to play. You know, I, I play with my shoulders hurting all the time, but I, I sleep with my shoulders hurting all the time, so it's no big deal. Um, I see something about nylon strings and and the the aplos and things like that having nylon strings on them. And here's the thing that uh, goes about those that particular and all these particular instruments that are inexpensive. And that is a good set of strings um, will cost you about $300. Like a full set, drones, synthetics, the whole thing will cost you, like a really good set, cost you about 300 bucks. If you're buying an instrument and the instrument costs $1,100, there's a really, really, really good chance that the strings did not cost 300 it's probably more in the $50, $60 range. And that means that uh, the strings that they put on the, the less expensive instruments are less expensive to keep the price down. Now it's on you if you want to increase, if you want to change the strings out as to what type of strings you want to put on. And strings come in all levels. You can get like the, you know, like I said, the, the, badminton string that uh, is the wonder string from Neil Brook. You could get, uh, it, it, below that, you get weed eater strings. I've seen those. Um, but they go up, you know, in stages from there to concert strings. So um, the nylon strings that they likely put on are likely not made for bowed instruments. The wound strings that they put on are likely made for bowed instruments excuse me, likely made for boat instruments, but they're really inexpensive. Um, so the, 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 when gut strings started becoming like harder to get or more expensive or more difficult to, to keep consistent, like you can pick up a gut string and if you spin it around and pull it tight, if it doesn't make the nice wave that you need for it to make, and it's got a like a weird flat spot in it. Or it doesn't it's not a correct string. There's a there's a spot in the string where it's too heavy, or there's a spot in the string where it's too thin. And gut strings are like that. You can't get a gut string and just assume it's going to be perfect because they're not. It's gut. It's you know it's a natural thing. Nylon, any sort of plastic, you can like molecularly set that so that it's perfect from end to end. So you've got no problems with it. So there's no heavier spots in the middle. There's no lighter spots. There's no, none of that. Plastic strings, though, um, 
originally started out uh, and at, for guitars. They're plucked, right? They're easier to play. You can push down on them and play them like a gut string. Um, and the, they eventually started using those and they put more weight on them by winding them uh, and started using those for as cheap violin strings. And there's a bunch of people, there's a, I can't remember, black, black ball strings or something like that. Uh, the, the violin community is like, whatever happened to these great strings? Well, they were cheap. That's one thing. It was like $14 for a set of four strings. Um, and they, they would play for a long time and people were happy with them. Uh, but, but they were the, the inexpensive version of the, the string that almost every trad player for, for, you know, probably a decade or so wanted to have on their instrument. Um, <clears throat> but now, because they stopped using this kind of this generic plastic core or plastic string, now all of the or majority of all of the, the strings that are, that are out there for violins or violas and things like that, they're, uh, a, they're, they're a plastic core, but they're a, it's a polymer core, I should say. But they are very specifically designed. Somebody in their engineering, the chemically engineered department, they've, they've chemically engineered the plastic so that it is stiffer or it is softer or it has some uh, different um, aspect to it that lends itself to a particular type of playing or a particular player or a particular instrument. And so the, the technology has gone from kind of the, the cheap nylon guitar string guitar or a, a strings to just where they're just, you know, clear plastic strings just made out of nylon or whatever um, to the now this like, you know, uh, um, complicated polymer cores and then they wind they overwind the, the, the cores. So um, nylon is is OK. Nylon's relatively, you know, it's, it's it's a reasonable thing, but it was made to be plucked. It was not meant to be bowed, except in the case where they're made specifically for bowed strings. Um, and that means that if you buy a cheap string, it's going to have a lot of stretch to it. And a lot of stretch means the response time for that string is poor. Um, and it, the, 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 the more, the, be the better the polymer is, the better the response time, the better overall sound. So you can get a cheap string. You put a cheap string on, it will sound, no problem. It, you may have it for, you know, 20 years, it may be great. But, um, but just know that, you know, the, the, the cheaper the, the string is generally means that the, there's some aspect of it that doesn't fit with the instrument that you're playing if you're, if you're just putting a guitar string on a hurdy-gurdy. And that's, that's why these things like Aplos uh, come with these nylon strings because they, they, they're cheap and they fit within the price range. So let's say you buy a good set that costs $200, $300. Other than breaking, how long should a set like that last? I mean, you're gonna buy a set every month, or oh well, it depends on whether you're a concert player or not. If you're, <laughs> if you're I, I've had them on that string. I think, well, no, that's not correct because I've, I, I broke a couple. Actually, somebody borrowed it and they broke one, and then I broke one, and then I was like, okay, I'm just gonna replace the, you know, but those are all the melody strings. The drones have been on there since I've owned it, so that's been five years. Uh, the trumpet strings have been on there since I've owned it and that's been five years so you know uh, and and I gotta say that I think that there is a this one that this instrument uh, the drones that are on there now have probably been on there for 15 years um, the gut strings I replace eh, depending on whether they need it about once every eight months to a year um, and, and so it's usually the melody strings that are most important. Those are the ones you're going to change more often, but you're only going to, but the drones and the trumpet, uh, they tend to last a really long time um, because you, they're not, you're not pushing tangents against them. So mm -hmm. you're not, uh, it, it, you know, uh, damaging the string in any, play, in right. any way. It, they're, just, they're just ringing. So yeah, so you're gonna, you'll get a longer life out of your, out of your drones and your trumpet. But uh, maybe every year, I, I've gone like five years and not changed some, but, uh, but it's, you know, as long as the sound is good. 
Okay, I, somebody else was asking a question at the same time. I'm going to look at the chat. I think it's... Wait, that might have been me. I was just saying that uh, on the Aplo, it's just the trumpet. That's the nylon string. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I, didn't, I was unaware. So one of the things that, um, that like I said, it's they're, they're probably less expensive strings to begin with. The, the other thing I need to, to on, the, on the subject of strings, I know we're probably like halfway or more than halfway into a break, but um, on the subject of string, there's, there's two, you get wound strings all the time. I mean, it's just like people putting them on instruments all over the place now where they used to be gut strings. Um, the, there's, there's two types of wound strings and the, there's flat wound strings and there's round wound strings. Now, most of the drones you get, um, aside from the ones that, you know, if you buy a, a drone for a cello or something or, a, you know, half cello or whatever, they may be flat wound. But um, because you're, because those strings, uh, the, the flat wound strings are really meant to be played by somebody who's sliding their fingers up and down the string as they play, um, you don't need the flat wound type. Um, and you, the round wound actually work. Uh, you, you'll get better longevity out of the round one. And that's and there's just two reasons for that. One is that the string itself, um, the, the, the core uh, on, a, on a round wound string is thinner and they add the weight with the metal that they put on top of it. The, the flat wound string is it's a thicker core um, and then they put the same winding on the thicker core that they put on the, the thinner core, but then they run it through a thing called a rectifier, which grinds it all evenly smooth across the entire length. So it's a round wound string that they've ground all the weight off of and the, the outer weight on so that you can move your fingers up and down it faster. And it, you know, everybody who's listening to a guitar player knows that when you start, when you hear them and they're playing their bass string, you can hear the, their fingers go zing up, you know, up and down the, 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 the string as they're playing. So it's going zing, 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 zing. You don't need to worry about that when you're playing hurdy-gurdy because you're pushing on the tangents and the tangents are only touching the string in one place. You're not dragging your fingers down it or you're not playing like a violin or a viola where you're, you're dragging your fingers back and forth. Um, so round wound, they tend to be more durable. The flat wound strings, the other thing that happens is when you wind the, 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 the winding onto the string, uh, it immediately hardens the metal that you're putting on there. And it's, it, it, it happens just because you're spinning the, the, um, the, the wire on there so fast that the wire actually becomes, uh, heats up and becomes hard. And once it becomes hard, then it, it becomes more brittle, um, then the opportunity for it to break goes up. Um, and flat wound strings, you've cut half of the thickness of that string off. So now it's got, it's just a little half size, you know, round wire um, that you've trimmed the whole top off. And that means that, that that's now that's the half the thickness. So if you twist the string in any way, it's very likely you're going to pop that winding. And, and the winding on those strings can be really, really, really brittle. I mean, like just a little quarter turn on some of those strings will pop the winding. And then once the winding is gone, you can put it back together. You can like super glue it back together again, but it starts to change the, the dynamics of the string. So round wound strings work really well for, a, for hurdy gurdies because you're not putting your fingers on them. They last longer and you tend to have a little more movement in how you can adjust them, how you can like twist them if you need to. I'm seeing stuff pop up. Um, so round wound versus, yep, badminton string, wonder string. Um, I, no, I wouldn't use bass strings. Yes, work hardening is what you're looking for. Uh, I wouldn't use bass strings on a, on a hurdy-gurdy because once again, you're back to the, the concept of plucked versus boat. Um, the, the dynamics are different. Like I said, they've, they've changed the, like the, the, I guess, I guess if you start with the, the gut strings, gut strings have always been kind of the same. You can put a gut string on a violin for the Baroque violin. You can put a gut string on a Baroque guitar and they'll play the same because the, the dynamics are the same in terms of movement. But um, once you get outside of that, you start moving off to these, the, the, the plastic cores. They've developed the plastic cores to be either plucked or bowed. 
And um, bowing a viol a bowing a, a guitar string means that there's more movement in the string, means that it doesn't have the the stick slip action that you want to create the the the, the vibration in the string to make the sound. Um, and it means that they, they tend to overbow, they stretch too far, and then they snap back too far. So there's no, the response is really sloppy, uh, the sound isn't all that great. So, you know, when you do, when you consider the, the hurdy-gurdy, remember it's bowed. And it's as much as everybody wants to put, put you know, uh, pluck strings on them, it, it's, it's, they're not the same. They're two different animals now. Um, so stick to the bowed string you know, world of, of strings uh, and, and try to avoid the, the plucked ones for what you're going to put on your instrument. Your sound response will be better. Your overall sound will be better. Your, you know, dynamics on the instrument will be better. The, those all make a difference. Now, when I say that, I'm, I'm talking about the bowed strings. I'm not talking about the, the sympathetic strings. You can put like thin little guitar strings on the sympathetics, but not on the bowed versions. Okay. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, somebody wants to know about whether it refers to the uh, melodic strings or the drone strings. It refers to both. Um, wound strings uh, have become more prevalent. This instrument, all of the instrument, all of the strings, with the exception of the trumpet, are wound strings. Um, uh, well, I guess the moosh is wound string. There's a gut string too, but. So essentially, I'm playing all the wound strings. Um, so it could be melody strings, it could be drones, uh, it could be both. Um, but in general, uh, the, the, the French style instrument, they use gut strings for the melody strings and wound strings for the drums. But uh, because the world of these, you know, the world of hurdy is changing so dynamically, uh, in terms of the, the sounds that people are, are getting out of them now and the, the sound that they want out of them, the deeper drone strings have become a thing. Um, and, or cheaper, sorry, deeper melody strings have become a thing. And so now you get these, these, uh, these octave tunings that are double octaves. So one would be like a, what I would consider a low G uh, is, is the first one, and then an extra low G is the second tuning. So. Um, so yeah, it refers to both. So just to, in terms of those, just make sure you get a, a something that re, in relation to a wound string. And, you, and I see that somebody's posted the wonder string up there. The wonder string is um, is very specifically used by uh, Neil Brook as a high D string. And that means if you've got a D instrument and you want to put a high D string on it and you don't want to put the gut on it, you use the wonder string. You can use a wonder string, but you, once again, Go back to that little section where I told you it's only 50% of the string in the middle of the wheel, not, not the whole way. Okay. I think we're way past D5. Oh, drums. Just a quick question there. Uh, yes, Scott. Mr. Taylor. Uh, are we on the um, maintenance section now? No. No, we're going to be taking a break and then we're going to make. I just over talked. So we're going to be doing the maintenance section. I just want to talk about strings and then I just got way too far into the break. So we're going to take a break. Everybody go good with the break. Okay, we're going to take a break. I'm going to stop recording and everybody gets to go do what they need to do and as well as myself. And uh, we'll see you back in a minute. I'm going to turn on the music. So be aware. <laughs> If you can't, if you, if it's really loud, turn it down now. You might be able to turn down uh, the YouTube end of it. That might. Uh.